throughout our nation's history, APHA has been there. We've been on the ground fighting for the public's health since 1872, taking on diseases, poverty, and sanitation at the turn of the century. We were there when Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. called for equal rights and continue today fighting to end racism and counter all of its devastating health effects. We were there encouraging auto safety standards and calling for seatbelt laws. Since then, we continue to support work to make our cars and roads safer and reduce injuries. APHA was there when women made their voices heard and supports their ongoing fight for equality and control over their own health. We fought for access to care as AIDS spread across the country and continue working to ensure easy and equal access for all to vaccines for COVID-19, the flu, and other infectious diseases. We've been sounding the alarm about climate change's impact on human health by raising awareness, and the world is listening. Change is happening, but these next years are so important. We need your help to shift the tide. By advocating for safe work, home and school environments, access to care, nutritious food, and reducing gun violence, we've strengthened our nation's public health. And APHA continues to develop and advocate for policies and programs that support the public's health and the public health workforce. We were there, and we're here today, and together we are moving forward. Join us as we celebrate APHA's 150th anniversary and look to an even brighter future. Together, we will continue to improve health and achieve health equity for all. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's town hall, keeping our community safe and thriving the role of public health. I'm Frank Sesno, and I'm honored to join you today as, as your moderator for this terrific event. For nearly two years now, I've hosted a podcast produced by the George Washington University's Milken Institute School of Public Health and the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW, where I work. We produce this podcast in association with the American Public Health Association and the de Beaumont Foundation. We focused on this pandemic. And I can just tell you that after all these years and dozens, maybe hundreds of interviews, I believe there's no more important conversation to be having than the one we're going to have here today. We have been through unprecedented strains and times these past two years. And unfortunately, public health itself has become a target. A number of states have worked to modify the authority and independence of health departments and local governments, even as the pandemic has raged. And 2001, some 26 states adopted laws that permanently weakened the authority of public health departments, often by shifting the power to issue critical public health and safety orders from local health, health experts to state politicians. Uh, several states passed laws that uh, banned COVID-19 vaccine mandates or made it easier to get around vaccine requirements. Many states passed new laws that ban or limit mask mandates. What's that mean? What are the implications for the other elements of public health? Where do we go from here? How do we process all of this? So many issues at play. And we hope that today's town hall will provide you with a deeper understanding of public health broadly and the role that it plays in keeping communities healthy, resilient, and thriving during a pandemic and we hope beyond. Public health leaders need to be able to act to pr protect and, and promote public health. So we'll hope you'll be inspired to take action out of all of this, to learn more about these issues and be a champion for public health in your own communities. We're going to start with a brief welcome from our co-hosts from the American Public Health Association, the Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response and the COVID Collaborative. So it's a pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. George C. Benjamin. He's the executive director of the American Public Health Association. You'll also hear from John Bridgeland. He's founder and CEO of the COVID Collaborative and CEO of Civica, which is a social enterprise firm here in Washington. And then from Julie, Dr. Julie Morita from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who will help us kick off this event. So Dr. Benjamin, over to you. Frank, listen, thank you very much. And I just wanna just thank all of our, our colleagues here, um, you know, Governor Levitt and Sebelius, who I had an opportunity to work with many times over the years, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, the COVID Collaborative, 
um, and our Alliance colleagues, because I think this is gonna be a very important opportunity for us to educate really the field um, and the general public uh, around the importance of public health. And as you, as you said, Frank, many of these laws are being passed really undermine our authority, not so much for COVID, which has been a real problem, but the fact is we believe that they undermine the public health's ability to do a lot of other things, to make sure the water is safe to drink, the air is safe to breathe, and the food is safe to eat, um, and really just to do our, our job as uh, public health professionals. Uh, we know we need to get involved to educate our partners and our colleagues, our friends and families around this. So this is our opening salvo uh, to do a better job of educating the public and our colleagues around this issue. So with that, I also like to just bring um, Mr. John Bridgeland, uh, who's the founder and CEO of the COVID Collaborative. John. And my old friend, Frank Cessna, so wonderful to see you again. And all the members of the COVID Collaborative who are on our program today, Dr. B, Dr. Marita, uh, Governor Sebelius, Governor Levitt, uh, just two outstanding governors and former secretaries of health and human services uh, across uh, different parties, uh, Haney Tours and Ray Hart, Corey Asto and Eduardo Sanchez for really the collaborative efforts over the last two years in COVID response. Our COVID collaborative is thrilled to co-host this event with APHA and the Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response. You know, I was thinking about this program. My earliest experiences with public health uh, saved my life and protected me from harm. The health system was there for my emergency appendectomy when I developed peritonitis at three years of age. And I remember so clearly getting vaccinated at my school for polio, measles, rubella, and other vaccine preventable diseases. Public health really felt like a blessing and a cultural norm. In speaking with Dr. Julio Frank, who's a member of our collaborative recently about the next move from uh, pandemic to endemic, he remarked that he had, he had lived through six pandemics and COVID was different from all of them and how strongly politics played a role. There will be a lot of discussion today about public health authorities, efforts to undermine them, as Frank and, and Dr. Benjamin both noted, and, and what we can do about it. Our hope is that this uh, town hall will actually be an action forcing event where concrete um, actions can emerge uh, to move us forward toward that end. I'd love to see an education campaign to remind the American people of the multiple ways in which public health keeps us uh, from harm and enhances our lives. A, a sort of a did you know effort uh, that told those stories, including in some of the most unexpected places. And we'd like to see a piece that plays out the various scenarios that could occur under the many state laws passed or proposed so Americans understand what's really at stake. So on behalf of the COVID Collaborative, just thank you for all you do and for participating today. It's now my pleasure to introduce a real heroine in public health, uh, Dr. Dr. Julie Morito, who's the Executive Vice President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Morita. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad to be with you all today. First off, a big thanks to Dr. Benjamin and APHA for spearheading today's town hall and to John Frisland for the COVID Collaborative for co-hosting this event, and to Frank Sesno for moderating this event. And thanks to the many organizations that had a hand in organizing this important convening as well. I also wanna take a moment to recognize the public health officials for joining us today from across the country. Thank you for all you do every day. Please know that at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we see you, we support you, and we stand by you. Lastly, I also want to acknowledge those of you who are joining us today from outside the health sector. You're, you play an essential role in building a stronger, healthier nation. And I'm truly heartened by your willingness to step up and to take action. I know there will be many important conversations happening today. So I'd like to share three key points to keep in mind as you dive in. First, it's critical for public health officials to have the authority to act quickly and nimbly in order to protect and save lives. Before joining the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I worked for two decades at the Chicago Department of Public Health, ultimately as commissioner. During the Ebola crisis, the Chicago O'Hare Airport was one of five receiving people from Ebola-affected countries. We were able to put rigorous screening and isolation measures in place to help detect disease and prevent transmission and spread. In another instance, the health department stepped in to quickly help avert a major meningitis outbreak among high school students. Our efforts worked because we had the authority to act and act fast. 
If that authority had been stripped away or restricted, these diseases could have had devastating impact on the people we were supposed to protect. Public health's ability to protect our children, our families, and our communities is at risk right now. More than half the states across the country have passed laws constraining the ability of public health leaders to protect their communities. Public health policies need to be guided by people who have public health expertise. And we must redouble our commitments to be accountable to the communities we serve, especially in an emergency where every moment counts. Second, public health leaders need to have the power to respond equitably making sure everyone has a fair and just opportunity to live the healthiest life possible, no matter who they are, where they live, or how much money they have. As we well know, COVID-19 has hit low-income communities, rural communities, and communities of color the hardest. And all too often, at baseline, these communities don't have a fair shot living at the healthiest lives possible. We need to use every tool available to make sure all communities have the means and the power to thrive. This includes ensuring access to testing and vaccines in the hardest hit neighborhoods. But right now in too many places, that's not happening because state lawmakers have blocked efforts to prioritize health equity. And that just hurt, ends up hurting everyone. We have to be willing to openly acknowledge and address the impact, the impact that societal barriers, including a structural racism have on everybody's health. And we need to expand our efforts to confront these barriers. APHA, as well as many state and local health agencies have officially declared racism to be a public health crisis, which is an important first step, but it's not enough. We have to make sure public health leaders have the authority to do what they do best, to use data and their professional expertise to tailor strategies that confront health inequities. We also need adequate and sustained funding. And they need the latitude to work with local communities to create effective and lasting solutions. If there's one thing we know for sure is that there will be another public health emergency. And unless we do something to prioritize health equity now, the same communities will be hit the hardest again and again. So that brings me to my final point. I want to encourage us all to join forces because in the end, we have the same goals. We want what's best for our families, our children and our communities. A lot of good can happen when we forge public-private partnerships that are strong and influential. So let's work together to push for policies that can strengthen these bonds. Let's give public health experts the power and the space that they need to put their expertise to work for everyone. And let's make sure they have the authority and the resources to act equitably and quickly enough to make a difference. If we do that, we can start making every community in America, a place that offers every person a fair and just chance to thrive. And that's what public health is all about. Thanks again for being here and have a great day. Now I'll turn it back to Frank. Thanks very much, Dr. Marita, for your comments and also from uh, Dr. B and John Bridgeland. It's a great way to set this up and it really frames it uh, around the issues that we're looking at here today and matter. So to set the stage some more, we're incredibly fortunate to hear from two national leaders in this space. They both have the distinction of having served their states as governors of the states, and then as um, Secretary of HHS, Health and Human Services, at the national level. Governor Kathleen Sebelius is currently the CEO of Sebelius Resources. She was elected four times uh, Kansas, uh, in Kansas as Governor and Insurance Commissioner. She served in President Barack Obama's cabinet as the 21st Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. After we hear from her, we'll hear from Governor Michael Levitt. He's the founder and chair of the board of managers of Levitt Partners, which is a healthcare consulting firm. But he too served three terms as governor, the great state of Utah from 1993 to 2003, and then as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and then secretary of health and human services in the cabinet of President George W. Bush. So two remarkable people, two remarkable perspectives. Here's Governor Sebelius to get us started. Well, I'm delighted to be able to join this important panel and critical discussion today. It's vital that we take a look at public health in the United States, around the world, and figure out not only what we can continue to do better, but how we make sure we are a more resilient, healthier country going forward. 
lots of lessons from COVID-19, lots of lessons from previous health crises. And I just would like to reflect on a few of those lessons, particularly given my perspective as both a former governor of the great state of Kansas and then as Health and Human Services Secretary. I want to give a special shout out to uh, Mike Levitt, who also served in those two roles, both as Secretary of Health and Human Services and as governor um, of his state. So he will have some important perspectives to share along with the rest of the distinguished panel. Let me just start by saying um, we have learned a lot. And I think that we don't have to give lessons anymore in how important health is to the economy of the United States. We've seen it real time. A health crisis can shut down the economy. And we know that if we are to be a more resilient, uh, more secure nation in the future, we have to be a healthier country. And that really begins with public health. Uh, secondly, what we know, and I learned this in my days as governor, that the federal government has unique and very important resources. Uh, the way disasters work in a state is if a tornado were to hit Kansas, if a flood comes through a town, uh, the local leaders call on the state to mobilize resources. And then if needed, the state calls on the federal government to give extra help and support, uh, deliver personnel, resources, equipment, um, technology that we don't have at the state level. So you learned early on that if, if there's trouble and there's trouble in a situation involving health, the federal government plays an important and unique role. Um, we had a flood in uh, the town of Joplin following a huge tornado. Joplin is a by border state, so both Missouri and Kansas were involved in this situation. People died, the hospital was wiped out, homes were wiped out, uh, but very quickly uh, the CDC was mobilized to come in and bring additional personnel, set up a temporary hospital like a mass unit, uh, test and make sure that the water was safe to drink to let people come back into their homes, uh, do a variety of things backing up the state and local leaders who, who did not have the resources or the expertise to deal with that situation. Uh, we had food safety outbreaks in an agriculture state like Kansas, and we knew that the FDA and their food safety program was critical to make sure that we could get products off the shelf if they were unsafe, to make sure that we could reassure the public that our food supply was safe and secure and that farmers in this part of the country didn't take a huge hit. So I learned the importance of the federal government working hand in hand with people during uh, times of great crisis at our state level. Um, we know that it requires mobilizing all the tools and resources that we have. And what we saw um, when I was secretary of HHS, we had, looking back, what is a mild outbreak, an H1N1 virus that greeted the early days of the Obama administration. He was a brand new president, and suddenly we had a strain of this flu, which had not been seen since 1918 the so-called Spanish flu, which is the worst pandemic in the world. And the terrifying thing was that not only did we not have vaccines that were equipped to deal with this flu strain, but young people and children were dying. And it really sent a shockwave through the country. What I also saw was people around the president trying to be supportive and helpful of the president were insistent that their political judgment should overrule scientific judgment, were insistent that uh, they would write guidance to uh, make sure that uh, the economy ran smoothly or that schools were closed or open. And over and over and over again, I watched a relatively new president sworn in in January dealing with this crisis in April, May, and June of his first year say, I'm going to defer to the science. I'm going to listen to the scientists. I'm going to make sure that my entire government is hands-on dealing with this situation, but the science is going to lead the way. And again, the CDC, the FDA, and the National Institutes of Health took the lead. 
So we we saw in 2020 a flip of that, where from the bully pulpit um, of the presidency, a different kind of communication was issued, trying to downplay the virus, trying to contradict the scientific issues. And I think, unfortunately, we are going to pay for that for potentially decades to come. Uh, the undermining of science as a lead in public health emergencies is something that we all have to take very seriously. In my state of Kansas, the legislature is busily drafting laws currently saying we shouldn't really follow guidelines uh, for any children's vaccine. And not only should we not have a vaccine mandate for COVID-19, but we shouldn't um, make children be vaccinated against measles or mumps or rubella in order to come to school. That would be a terrifying step back um, in our public health uh, future. We have to have, I believe, a sort of post 9-11 moment when uh, we can put COVID in the rear view mirror in terms of a debilitating pandemic. And by that, I mean mobilize the information and resources, again, at the federal level needed to not only deal with what's coming in the future, but rebuild the public health infrastructure around the country. Uh, public health officials from CDC are embedded in every state and help to keep vital statistics and keep that safe, safe and secure. Those have been decimated. We know that uh, people are more mistrustful of information that they hear uh, they are less likely to listen to local officials. So I think that it is a critical time to not only look at what we did correctly to deal with this pandemic, but where the gaps were, how we can be more resourceful in the future. And uh, a couple of ideas come to mind. First, we have to fix what are huge gaps in data collection and exchange at the state level. Uh, states are still running different data sets, counting different things. And so information is confusing at best and erroneous at worst. It's very difficult to look across the country and see what we're dealing with if the data collection and the data exchange is not there. Secondly, President Biden proposed this, but I think we need to go back to his proposal of a major health core throughout this country, uh, a couple of hundred thousand people who are trained health workers at the local level, out of neighborhoods. Uh, they call them promotories at communities on the border where neighborhood workers are really dealing with their neighbors and friends, knocking on doors of pregnant women, making sure they get to prenatal visits, uh, making sure if there's some sort of outbreak that people are aware of how they can get help and support. I think that kind of neighbor to neighbor, person to person effort, particularly in our most vulnerable communities, could be a huge step forward in building a public health infrastructure back in the United States. We desperately need to work on national and state communications and messages. Uh, there needs to be training of reporters throughout the country, but also training of public health officials and government officials to know how to speak about uh, health issues and disasters and interpret data. Uh, make sure that we have a national response, but local interpretation of what that national response looks like. And the people are very comfortable pushing back against erroneous and misinformation. Social media makes this much, much more difficult, but every elected official has a social media account, knows about using social media, and we have to use all the tools available to get correct information to people in real-time basis and make sure they understand how to access additional material if they need it. And finally, we need to connect and reconnect our global health community. What I learned as HHS secretary and learned as I visited countries around the world is, first of all, the United States is looked at as the gold standard. Uh, the National Institutes of Health is the research gold standard. Every country in the world wants a CDC and a variation of CDC, the public health backbone of the country. They want a process to have safe drugs on the market like the FDA does. But what we also know is that we are not safe and secure as Americans unless we have worldwide 
health and security, that our efforts to make sure that Americans are protected at the border uh, doesn't work unless we actually can find and identify and wrap our arms around and stop diseases and viruses from getting to these borders. Viruses, as we learn very clearly, don't need passports. Uh, they don't regard any kind of uh, state or national border. They are readily shared, as we saw with H1N1, when North America was the nexus of the virus outbreak. We saw uh, most recently with COVID-19 coming out of the East, we've seen with MERS, it emerges from the Middle East. But these are global issues and we need to re-engage the United States quickly and robustly in global health. So again, I'm delighted to join this conversation. Nothing could be more important to America's safety, to American security, to America's resilience than rebuilding a public health infrastructure, having workers for the future, re-engaging with our colleagues across the globe in dealing with uh, these critical issues and making sure that we are better prepared and uh, better ready to deal with health issues at the national, state, and local level. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to say hello and appreciation to my friend Kathleen Sebelius, Frank, and to the sponsors. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'd like to talk in the brief time we have together. I'd like to provide you with what I believe to be five imperatives for public health over the next five years. I'd like to start with what I believe to be among the most important, and that is understanding the core issue behind ma uh, masks, vaccines, and, uh, pu and public health uh, guidelines. Now, uh, you know, I, I view myself to be a public health practitioner and a public health expert and a public health policy person. But I'd like to just relate to you, if I could, um, this core issue by telling you a story, a kind of personal and painful story about my own experience. Uh, Frank mentioned the fact that I uh, was governor for three terms, which means I went through three statewide elections. As I approached my last election, I had taken what turned out to be a, a far more controversial issue, a, a position on an issue than I ever thought it would be. I took the position that you really shouldn't be taking guns to church. Uh, it turned out that there was a group of people who felt very strongly that my position was wrong and that therefore uh, I ought not to continue to be governor. Uh, I went to actually a political convention where I expected, as a three-term governor, to be fairly well, uh, to slide through it without a lot of trouble. And uh, I got up and, to give my speech, and to my surprise, I was roundly booed. Um, and that afternoon, uh, that convention pushed me into a primary election I hadn't expected. Now, I will tell you that all turned out just fine, but the less, a, a good lesson came to it uh, for me. I concluded I really need to know what went on that day. What's happening out there that I don't understand? And I uh, uh, organized a dozen what I called hangar meetings. And I got on an airplane and I flew throughout my state, stopped at various airports, and I had a group of people there who I could talk to and I could say, I don't understand what's happening. Help me understand what those people were feeling. Well, as we were into that group of meetings at a break, I was standing over a pastry and some orange juice, and a man said to me, look, Governor, I don't want to take my gun to church, but this is really about my pickup. Let me tell you about my pickup truck. He said, I have a three-quarter ton pickup, and I have a backhoe, and I wanted to go to a neighboring county to provide, to, to dig a trench for a fellow. And I got to the checking station and they said, no, you now have a commercial truck. You're going to have to collect taxes. So I registered as a commercial truck. Then I was told I needed to get a commercial driver's license. And then I was told I had to, had to drug test 
employees because I had a commercial truck and I had a commercial driver's license. Turned out I'm the only employee, so I have to drug test myself. He said, look, I just wanted to go get a trench, Doug, not to become, to, to unleash all of this regulation. He said, if they can do that to my truck, imagine what they can do to my gun. Now, what I learned from that experience was that this wasn't about guns. It was about the role that government should play in our lives. Now, I'm not here to take a position. I, I, I've been in federal government, I've been in state government, and I know that government has a critical role in our lives. But I learned something important from that experience, and it is that whenever people would bring those issues up to me, rather than try to talk about the merits of guns in church or not, I said, what I'm understanding from you is that you don't like the government to be telling you what to do. And it opened up an entirely different conversation. So to those of you who are struggling, as I have, with why we have such difficulty with masks and why there's so much controversy over vaccines and public policy making, I just want to make the point clear here that this isn't just about masks or vaccines or public policy. It's really about what is the role of government. And my suggestion to you is that when we confront those, actually open up the real issue, which is what I hear you saying is that you don't like the government telling you what to do. And this is important because many times we look at this and say, look, the prescription here is just having more government to tell people what to do. There's at least half the people in this country who aren't believing that. And so we have to learn, the imperative is, learn how to talk about the real issue, which is what will the role of government be in our lives? The second imperative, we have to shift from a set of, of, of defined group behaviors into a period that I'm going to refer to as a period where we're teaching risk management. Uh, we're going to go through a period, a multiple year period, I think, where there are regional spikes, public health interventions that are necessary from time to time. And we need to begin to realize that our capacity to impose group behaviors is going to be somewhat limited. And so we have to teach people the, the, not, that there are many ways in which you can deal with this risk, but they are at risk and there's no such thing as zero risk and we can give them the tools to avoid that. Which obviously start with vaccines and masking where appropriate, et cetera. The third thing is to, uh, Kathleen uh, Sebelius mentioned it, I just wanna put a finer point on it. We have got to get data right here and we, we are, particularly as it relates to, as she pointed out, data sets. I learned after many, many years of trying to develop standards that there are three ways you can create standards. You can have the government set it, and oftentimes they'll get it wrong. You can have the marketplace try to establish it by having the last vendor standing, or you can, number three, uh, you, you, we, we can do it collaboratively. The states have got to become collaborative in being able to determine how, these, how this data, in fact, will be uh, developed. And the federal government has to become a convener because if just establishing them by fiat, ultimately will not work. Number four, I just want to say quickly, I think the a crisis ahead of us is long COVID and no one's taking it seriously yet. Uh, and we, we've got to begin to start thinking about it. I understand we've had the crisis in front of us. This is a longer term issue. And finally, the fifth imperative for the next five years will be for us to integrate public health with the, uh, with the larger health care providing system. Uh, public health and, and uh, the hospital systems, the health plans and the broader health community uh, they don't know each other. They've become better acquainted during the pandemic, but we need to nurture those relationships. So norm, uh, understand the core issue and begin to speak in language that allows us to unlock it. Shift to a period of risk management 
streamline our data, take long COVID seriously, and begin to integrate with the, the larger healthcare system. So uh, Frank, thank you. I think that completes my remarks. And if you had wanted to have a conversation, we could. I do. I want to follow one point up in particular, <clears throat> because it was something that Governor Sebelius mentioned. It's something that you mentioned, and it's something that all of us work with all the time. And that is, how do we communicate this? You, get, you told that very wonderful story. And some of that was about resistance and, 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 and opposition to sort of being told what to do by government. But some of it may also be how we speak. What do you uh, have to contribute and think and, and say about, about that? Um, terms to avoid, terms to go for, what you've learned and find that is effective? Well, I'll just repeat for emphasis the point I made. And that is I have so many times in politics, and this is, you know, we're in a period where it's very political. Uh, we, we use symbols to talk about larger issues. And in this case, the larger issue in my view is what is the role that government should play? And I believe that public health officials and public health practitioners, when they're confronted by what seems to be a, a totally irrational point of view about masks or vaccines or some policy, rather than try to debate the merits of a mask or even the science of a mask, realize that what's underlying that question really is that there's a lot of people in this country who don't trust government. And there's a lot of people in this, in this, in this uh, country that don't trust markets. And we're talking by each other. And if you can get to that conversation, as opposed to having the conversation about how foolish one side or the other is, then it becomes less emotional and we begin to have that conversation in ice for the people across the country who are watching this now and thinking, okay, well, I've run into these things. How can I communicate better and more effectively? Well, my one piece of advice is when they're dealing with debates over vaccines and debates over masks, to just add, to, to begin the conversation by saying, what I'm hearing you say is you're really uncomfortable with the government telling you what to do, uh, or you're really uncomfortable with the other side of it and begin to get them to talk as opposed to just digging in because it's fruitless because you everyone on this call has had these has have had these conversations but i've concluded and i have learned and i have experienced many many times in the last several months that the experience i had uh, on the campaign trail where i realized i was debating the wrong issue uh, was a very important learning moment for me, and I hope I've shared it with others today. Well, you have. Governor Levitt, thank you very much for your comments here and for, for all your service, and I will take your words to, to heart, and I, I hope that that can advance the cause. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, next up, we have two people who know these issues and challenges very well from the front lines at the state and local levels. Uh, we're joined by former Indiana Senator Luke Kenley, uh, he was first elected to the Indiana State Senate in 1992. And it says here he brought Hoosier values and experience to the State House. So, Luke Kenley, thanks very much for joining us. And I think you're muted. So, if you can take yourself off mute, we'll be able to hear you a little bit better. And while you're doing that, I'll introduce our other guest, who's Dr. Uh, Mashika Roberts. Uh, she's the health commissioner from Columbus, Ohio. And Dr. Roberts, uh, has a 20 year public health background at the lo local, state and national levels. And prior to her appointment as a health commissioner there, she was medical director and assistant health commissioner at Columbus Public Health. So Dr. Roberts, welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, presuming that everybody's mics are up and running, uh, let me ask you each to give just a brief overview from sort of your perspective and experience, just a couple minutes, and then we'll engage in, in, in conversation. Luke Kenley, let me invite you to go first. Well, thank you, Frank. I'm a technologically a midget here, so I <laughs> finally got the unmute done. It, it's great to be here. Uh, I, I served in the Senate for 25 years. Uh, as I was listening to Governor Levitt talk, I was one of those uh, not interested in government fellows who ended up serving 25 years, most of the time on running the Finance Committee or the Budget Committee. So uh, in Indiana, we are fortunate to have a governor who has the strength to say, we need to study our public health system. Are we doing okay? What should we do better? 
what kind of emergency preparedness do we have to have? What kind of governance would be better? We have a very fine commission that's been put together. Uh, my challenge probably as the co-chair of the committee, as the governor said, is to figure out a way to talk to the legislators so that they can understand where we're going and how we do this and get past some of the conversations that the governor referred to about, let's don't have a debate about the mask and the argument. Fortunately, we're finding out that the need to improve public health care is gonna be such an important asset to the state going forward that we don't really have to touch those particular issues. And I mean, glad to share with everybody how we're doing that. One of the things that I did was when I was first appointed as chair, co-chair, I called every legislator who serves on either the health committee in the Senate and the House. I called the president pro tem of the Senate, the speaker of the House, and then I made arrangements where I could give them a monthly report via email of everything that we were talking about. And then Dr. Box, our fine health commissioner, and I have done 20 Zoom meetings with people from county commissioners to county councilmen to mayors to school officials to the Chamber of Commerce, to the Manufacturers Association, to healthcare groups. So we think that transparency and sharing our story is gonna be the best way to do this. Fortunately, the governor's asked us to put together a report sometime next summer, July or August, with the idea that we need to go to the 23 session and have recommendations about how to improve public health in Indiana, both as to structure and funding and preparedness and every issue that we have. And we're off to a fine start with good people who are committed and uh, amazingly few arguments. I think uh, we're on the right track at this point. It sounds, it's very interesting. And what I'm really hearing you saying uh, loud and clear is constant contact, constant conversation uh, and transparency with these, with the folks that you're talking to uh, across the state. Uh, Dr. Roberts, um, uh, how about from your perspective? Thanks, Frank. Um, I'm proud to serve as the health commissioner for Columbus, Ohio, which is the 14th largest city in the country. As the capital city for Ohio, as well as the home of the Ohio State University, Columbus is very diverse, as well as progressive. Um, and it's probably um, demonstrably more progressive and diverse than the rest of our state. Like cities across the country, we have been faced with many public health challenges that have been exacerbated during this COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 definitely put the spotlight on public health and the unique challenges we all face as we respond to this once in a lifetime pandemic. During this pandemic, the dichotomy between my authority as a health commissioner and the necessary collaborations with federal, state and community partners, each with their own perspective, political interests, and ideas of how to best respond played out in unexpected and challenging ways. These challenges quickly became apparent when Columbus was set to host the Arnold Classic in March of 2020. This event, which brings millions of dollars into the city of Columbus, as well as the state, as it welcomes thousands of athletes from 200 countries, at a time when COVID-19 was just starting to be identified here in the United States. Two days before that event started, I decided, I decided to follow the data as well as my gut to cancel that event to protect our community. My decision was quickly called into question by our governor and I was asked to join him to help make this decision because it was going to be a profound impact on our city, state, and of thousands of athletes who were set to come. After many lengthy conversations with the governor, the state health commissioner, our mayor, and the organizers of the event, and even Arnold Schwarzenegger himself, we ultimately decided to cancel all the events, but one with no spectators. It was a tough decision. And I received a lot of negative pushback, but ultimately it was the right decision to make. While collaboration and cooperation were strong in the beginning of this public health um, event, our public health powers worked and that's what made us be able to keep our community safe. But we soon faced state legislature, which sought to limit the very powers that protect the public. COVID-19 had become not only a health issue, but a political one. As a result of that action, our state legislator um, 
stripped health departments of our power to put public health measures in place. Now we have to look to our elected officials, like in my instance, my mayor and city council to put public health measures like our current mass mandate in place. I'm fortunate that I have a supportive mayor, supportive city council members that really get it and understand public health, but many communities in Ohio aren't so lucky and really across the country. Their hands, public health hands have been tied. These restrictions greatly limit our ability to do what's needed when it's needed to protect the health and safety of our community. In spite of that, we're committed to doing the work that we have to do and we are strong. Columbus Public Health will continue to do everything we can to protect and serve the public during COVID-19 and beyond. And all public health issues are important as we face even more in the future. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on this illustrious panel and happy to answer any questions you might have of me. Great. Well, let me let me let me do that. Let me go right to, to really the core of what you were just talking about, which is the recently passed legislation that that ties your hands. And I'm interested in your thoughts on this. And 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 then um, uh, Senator Kenley, please jump in as well on how you and health officials in your situation may be different because you say you've got a very supportive mayor and city council. But how do you find health officials are navigating this new normal, this place where, to some extent, their hands are tied or at least um, restricted? So I, it's a mix. I mean, I see some that are just sitting back and they're doing what they can within the walls of their organization. And they feel that they can't say anything or do anything else because of the political pressures around them. And then I see others trying to do the best they can with the resources they have. So instead of ordering a mask mandate, they're doing mask advisories. Um, so they're telling the public, this is what we'd like to see happen. We'd like you to wear a mask. We'd like you um, to get vaccinated, but we can't mandate it. So we're calling it an advisory. So I see a mix um, and obviously none of them are as effective as mandates. Luke Kenley, your thoughts on this? Well, I, I think the key here is communication and uh, trying to figure out a way to have the conversation on a playing field that everybody has an interest in. One of the things that we're doing here in Indiana is we have a lot of rural counties. Two thirds of our counties have less than 50,000 people in them. Half of that group has less than 25,000 people. Under our current structure, the local health department's completely funded by the county, and there's just not enough resources to get that job done. So we're talking about things that particularly will be of interest to rural, rural counties. For example, many of them don't even have emergency medical vehicles to deal with the issue on that front end, and yet the state, that's where the state can step in and help provide some answers to that. Another big problem that I've been, I've been a little bit surprised there seems to be some consensus on the idea that healthcare costs are spiraling out of control and very high. And so using this as a forum, when you point out that public health initiatives, which are preventive in nature, can actually save $14 for every dollar that you invest. And then that engages the hospitals and the medical professions because they don't necessarily want to protect their turf, but they want to be engaged in the conversation of how do we do this better at the right price. So it's an issue about communication, reaching out, and having those conversations. Let me ask you both very quickly, because then we need to move on. Unfortunately, the clock is, is not our friend here. We've got a lot we need to do. But people who are watching this conversation from around the country, many of them obviously will be in states, in places where um, there have been some of these laws passed restricting the authority of people like yourselves, and uh, especially Dr. Robertson, in public health. Thinking about the future of this pandemic as it becomes endemic, thinking about future threats, what's at stake here? And what should people do? What should they be communicating to whom now if they're concerned about the future? Dr. Roberts? Well, I think they should be talking to their elected officials. I mean, I think they need to make it very clear that they're concerned. You know, I like, what, 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 what should they say besides I'm concerned? Well, I think they should say that the, the legislature was wrong and that we need to give the authorities to the experts and not to elected officials and that we need to empower our, our local health departments as well as our state health departments, because this legislation also stripped the state health department from doing that, as well as the governor. So we need to empower those who have the information to do what is right. You know, I liken public health to insurance. 
when you get car insurance, you have to have car insurance. You might not ever get an accident, but you have to have car insurance. Public health is very similar to that. And you don't want a policy that doesn't cover a fire to your vehicle. You want a policy that covers all aspects. And just like public health, you want public health to be able to respond to anything, a pandemic, as well as an individual case of something that could go spir could spiral out of control in your community. Luke Kenley, what's your take on that? Well, I think we have lots of facts at hand that help defuse the argument that uh, somehow or other we're taking away people's rights and privileges. And if you look back at, for example, even seatbelt laws and the understanding now that tobacco is a hazard, things like that are, those are conversations that are done and over with. So I think Governor Levin pinpointed the issue about how much government do you wanna have in your life or how is government gonna be working? And I think we have a lot of ammunition, a lot of facts that prove that this is economically beneficial to everybody to be able to do some of these things. And the level of intrusion is not necessarily the point that we need to be arguing about all the time. So we need to communicate, deliver the facts, change the conversation from the combative two issues that we all wanna talk about all day long on the radio and talk shows, which are masks and vaccinations. We need to change the conversation. And change the conversation, broaden it to these other serious health care, public health issues that, that people can relate to and understand. That's right. And they're going to, they, even the conservative, the most conservative person is going to agree, yes, that's right. We These things do work. Yes, we do have this need in our rural counties. Yes, we do need to solve these other problems. So get it on the, get it on a level where you can do it. And it, it takes a little courage from the leadership and a little willingness to be listening as well as talking, I think sometimes. Kenley and uh, Dr. Mashika Roberts, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and good luck in your work. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, let's look at something else now, and that is the sort of legal and legislative backdrop to all of this. We've heard a number of perspectives, and up now, let's talk to Hemi Tourson. Uh, Hemi is the executive director of the National Academy of State Health Policy, uh, which is a nonpartisan forum of policymakers throughout state governments. Uh, learning, leading, and trying to implement uh, solutions, and we hope innovative solutions to health policy challenges. Um, you know, you've heard a lot so far from the governors and now from the state and the, and the local level, from the public health level. Um, from your perspective, why don't you take a couple of minutes and uh, set the stage for this and what you see happening, what your perspective, and by the way, thanks very much for, for joining us here and for your time today. I think you're still muted, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Hi. Um, thanks so much for having me. And, and it's it's really, a, it's a pleasure to hear all of these perspectives and be here with you today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what are next steps? What, what have states been doing on the legislative front and where could they be going next? And we certainly have heard a little bit about that already um, from those who've already spoken before me. Um, you know, here at Nashby, we work with all state leaders, we work with legislators, we work with Medicaid directors, we work with governor's advisors, we work with public health officials, and so we really have a broad perspective on, you know, what states are doing and where they might go next. And so, you know, just taking a, a minute to just reflect back on what have states been doing on the legislative front. They have been, you know, reviewing and revisiting their public health systems, taking a range of approaches that I think both reflect um, reactions to cultural ten tensions and public concerns. And look, there's a lot of legislation that's been passing because some of the public is asking for that. Um, and that is really, I think, a reflection of, of where some of um, the folks are, um, where we are in COVID-19. But there's also been legislative action that I think really wants to learn from where we've been in this pandemic and wants to build on the resources that have been provided and really build up partnerships with communities. So I really wanna talk about both of those pieces because I think that's the opportunity. That's the opportunity of where we can really have an impact and, and make sure that we're modernizing public health in the right direction. Um, so let me talk a little bit first about um, what has been the direct response to COVID-19 that we've already started to talk about in this conversation. There have been a number of laws. It, 2021 was very active with respect to state legislation um, uh, with laws that have limited or reallocated the authority of state and local public health officials. Um, a lot of these laws that we've already talked about, they've addressed masking, vaccinations, isolation and quarantine. 
and business and school closures. And some of those pieces are core public health authorities um, that, that need to be used when you're in the, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, the actions have shifted the authorities from the executive branch to the legislative branch or from the local level to the state level and have included limiting the ability of governors and or state and local public health officials from taking independent action uh, to address public health emergencies now and because of the actions taken in the future as well. So I just want to take take a minute to, to talk about the term preemption because that has come up with respect to some of these laws. And what preemption can mean is when a higher level of government removes or limits the authority of a lower level of government. And so some of the examples of uh, preemptive laws are state laws that have been enacted that prohibit the ability of the executive branch or local health authorities from issuing mass mandates or requiring COVID-19 vaccinations or limiting the power of public health officials to order quarantine or isolation. In some states that resulted in local school districts uh, unable to require vaccinations for teachers or requiring masks for students um, and state laws that prohibited employers um, including in healthcare settings from requiring vaccines or requiring vaccines from entering um, business premises. I think there's other laws um, that have specifically restricted a governor or state commissioner of health authority in public health emergencies, um, which would allow local elected officials to terminate public health emergency declarations or allow the legislature to terminate a governor's executive order. So these laws, while I think they were enacted in the context of COVID-19 response, as written will have broader impact as they will limit the ability of state executive branches or local health departments from taking action in the future. There are also legislative efforts that are focused on improving uh, public health. And I wanted to just spend a minute talking about that because we really haven't touched on that um, in the prior conversation. So there are laws that, have, that are addressing collective decision-making, strengthening local public health authority, increasing transparency, reflecting on lessons learned and investing federal dollars, which there are many at the moment um, in public health capacity. And a couple of examples. So one trend is establishing commissions or other advisory bo bodies to make recommendations regarding public health emergency response efforts. I think we can all um, reflect that we can learn a lot from what we've done during this pandemic, what where there have been some successes and where there was a lot of areas of improvement. Our public health system was not ready um, to take on um, what it was presented itself with, and, and I think there was room for lots of improvement. So across the states, there have been some laws where they're establishing commissions that can study the state's response to COVID-19 and make recommendations that can help assist in a more effective response in the future. There's public health advisory boards that have been established to advise and provide feedback to the government public health system and provide formal recommendations on public health infrastructure, workforce, and laws, and the advisory board will include community represent, representation, because I think one thing we have learned is we really need to reflect back on community need um, when we think about what comes next. I think another trend in some of these bills is related to increasing transparency and accountability. Um, some of the laws um, require some form of written ex explanation or justification for actions taken. So governors have to state specific reasons for why um, you will close a school or a business. Um, and they require they would require written fact-based public explanations for declarations and extensions of states of emergency, including geographic scope. And then I think there are some examples of laws that really expanded the health system capacities to support public health. So there was an expansion of scope of practice for EMTs and dentists and optometrists, podiatrists, pharmacists, and pharmacy techs to provide vaccinations. There are requirements that insurance cover COVID-19 related services, vaccination, and testing. So really, how can we bring in the broader health system to help public health in its effort to address a pandemic? And I think what's really interesting is some of these laws, it's not, um, they, they can both restrict emergency powers while imposing additional requirements to improve the public health system. And when you really dig into the laws themselves, nothing is simple and straightforward. Um, there's one example I was just reading yesterday about a law that, you know, at, on one hand gives the legislature expanded authority and places restrictions on businesses regarding vaccine requirements. Um, but it also makes public health emergencies subject to the State Emergency Management Act, which could potentially allow for better preparation and coordination across state agencies. And it requires the Department of Health to submit an emergency management plan. And there's gonna be new inventories of, of protective equipment and capacity. So, you know, I think what we've learned is 
things can be done in, at the structural level that can really improve our system for the future. The other thing I just wanted to mention, just, just reflecting back on, on kind of where we are and where we go, I repeat again, you know, these laws are being passed and enacted because of public opinion. There are people who really are frustrated with COVID-19, um, want to be moving on um, with their lives, and it's been a long two years. I also think there are those that are that want to improve the public health system and want to make sure that we do it better um, if and when we're faced with another pandemic, which I'm sure will be the case. And reflecting back on back on where there's opportunities, you know, I do think there's a real need to communicate with the public to rebuild public trust in public health. Um, I think that is at, at the forefront of all of this, um, because that will then be reflected in the laws that are passed and the actions that are taken by elected leaders. I also think there is a need to improve our data systems. Um, the public health data systems um, were antiquated, um, had not been, um, had really had not benefited from a lot of investment. And we need to, we've seen the limitations of those data systems. Um, we need to upgrade those. We have to make them interoperable. We have to modernize them and they need to really connect with other parts of the healthcare system. I also think that we need to reflect back on what are the partnerships that we have really um, effectively built during this COVID-19 pandemic and many have been built. Um, more partnerships with the community, more partnerships with public health and the broader healthcare system and partnerships between the public and private sector. And those are things that um, really need to be built upon at the state level where we can really make a difference and I think um, improve upon what we do next. Let, let me, let me, if I may, come back to something that you were yeah. talking about a moment ago, which is very intriguing and might be of great use to people from across the country yeah. in, in um, I, I, I hope anyway, in states where, where this is uh, unfolding. You talked about um, the, the, commissions and advisory boards that are happening in several places. And it sounds to me like you're suggesting that, that those could be very useful fora for bringing people together from different places and walks of life to do the kind of talking and listening that Governor Levitt was talking about. Do you have um, observations of sort of best practices about where this is unfolding most constructively? where the, the people could take and bring to their own state or their own communities uh, to replicate. Yeah, so, you know, there's different places across the country that are doing this in different ways. And, you know, I love all states, but um, a couple of examples on um, Washington state, I think is really um, pursuing a bill that can really build, um, bring different types of stakeholders together. New Mexico is really focused on how it can have a public advisory board um, to advise its governmental um, system to really do better. And, you know, there is efforts going on at the federal level, right? Um, uh, Congress is talking about this, right. of how do we reflect um, on how to improve the system. So and how, how should those groups be put together, do you think? To how, what should the reporting structure be? What should the mission of it be so that it's not a stacked deck, right? So that it actually is a constructive, thoughtful process that can move this forward constructively. Yeah. So, you know, I think, of course, every community knows itself best, but you really have to reflect on a diversity of members in that kind of group. Um, you should have providers, you should have members of the public, you should have those who are on the front lines, you should have your health plans and your healthcare providers who are serving folks. You should have people outside the healthcare system, businesses. You really do have to have a diverse perspective to really understand um, what people are thinking about in terms of how public health needs to be improved. And people really have different perspectives. I've been so interested to hear um, you know, those perspectives as they come together on a lot of different healthcare topics, things that you wouldn't even, if you're in the healthcare system yourself, you wouldn't think about the way someone else views it. Um, employers, I mean, they played a role in all of this. Um, so you know, having those di diverse perspectives while hard and, you know, um, unwieldy perhaps um, to bring together, I think is really important to get, get a true sense of, of what your community needs. Well, Hemi Tours, thank you so much for, for this perspective. It's very important, a lot, of, a lot of activity because what you're saying is there's something like this going on in almost every state in the country right now. So knowing it and, and tracking it and being part of it is so important for people who care. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. So up now, a panel that's going to bring very different perspectives, experience to this discussion about public health, different walks of life, and, and as I say, different perspectives. So Cynthia Hallett, she's president and CEO of Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights. She's worked at the National Cancer Institute, UCLA Comprehensive Cancer Center, in addition to serving as a governing counselor and chair for the alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs uh, section of American Public Health Association. So Cynthia Hallett, welcome to you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. No um, Dr. Ray Hart, let me just introduce everybody and I'll come back to you and let you take a couple of minutes. Dr. Ray Hart, he's at the Council of the Great City Schools. Dr. Hart is executive director of this organization. It's a coalition of urban public school systems dedicated to the improvement of education for children in inner cities. And Dr. Hart, as I understand it, prior to this, you uh, served as executive director of research, planning, and accountability at the Atlanta Public Schools. So you know big school systems very, very well. So thanks to you for your time today as well. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. And finally, uh, Corey Astle. Corey is vice president of healthcare and, uh, of, of healthcare and retirement at the Business Roundtable. And so in that role, and you see Corey there with his microphone, he's armed and ready to go here. Um, he leads the Business Roundtable's Health and Retirement Committee, um, which advocates for affordable and innovative health care, um, including America's um, employer-sponsored health benefit system. So a um, lot going on, and very, as I said at the outset, very distinct uh, perspectives. So Cynthia Hallett, let me come back to you to start with. Let me ask you each to keep your opening remarks brief so that we can have a, a conversation here, a minute or two, and then we'll come back and kick it around. Um, but very interested in, in, in your perspective. And Cynthia Halleck, why don't you start? Wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, so Americans for Non-Smokers Rights is a national public health advocacy organization working to clear the air of secondhand smoke. And we've been doing this since 1976. And the last couple of years during the pandemic created some opportunities and several challenges. Uh, but one of the things that I think was consistent and useful to some extent was given that this was a respiratory driven pandemic, uh, it became easier for us to communicate our messages about expelling secondhand smoke and potentially sharing respiratory droplets that could possibly transmit COVID-19. And so as a result, in addition to talking about the health effects of secondhand smoke, we were able to communicate that smoke-free indoor air could potentially protect public health in a broader sense. Um, for background information, currently over 62% of the US population is protected by either a local or statewide smoke-free workplace, restaurant, and bar law, but you know that leaves some big gaps. And many of those gaps, not all, but many of them are in states that preempt local activity. So we do still have challenges with preemption. And in fact, in the last two years, we've seen kind of an uptick in something called exempt and preempt. And so in places where we've had really strong statewide or even local laws, what they'll do is preempt, say, a small portion of a law. And what we're seeing are a lot of cigar bar or smoking lounge exemptions to either permit tobacco use or marijuana and cannabis use or to vape tobacco and nicotine or, or marijuana products. Um, so the good news is, though, that during the pandemic, sovereign tribal nations really took the lead in thinking about their reopening guidelines and making, in particular, their casino smoke-free something that we hadn't seen a lot of. And in large part, it was tied to the mask mandate. You know, how can you safely wear a mask, but then pull it down to smoke and exhale secondhand smoke? Um, and Navajo Nation just recently implemented, one of the largest tribes implemented, implemented a very comprehensive smoke-free workplace, restaurant, bar, and casino law. We also experienced one of the first completely virtual city council campaigns. We had done work in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana prior to the pandemic, but the entire campaign from committees to the final vote were all done virtually. And so we did have some success there, again, being able to communicate from individuals who are like the affected parties. And that's something that we do is try to work at the grassroots level, whether it was back in the late 80s when we worked with flight attendants to try to get smoking off of airplanes, which we will celebrate the 32 year anniversary this Friday, February 25th, or currently working with casino workers in Atlantic City or musicians in Tennessee to put a real face on the problem and why they deserve protections from secondhand smoke and again, from exposure to respiratory viruses. Great, great, thank you very much. Come back in the conversation in just a minute. Dr. Hart, next to you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the Council of Great City Schools represents uh, 77 of the largest urban school districts in the country. Uh, and we're happy to, one, be a part of this program, but also share uh, a bit about uh, our program, our, our schools and our school districts. Julie uh, Marita noted earlier uh, in the conversation that 
communities of color and low income communities in particular are more adversely impacted by the pandemic as well as health challenges. Our schools serve a large percentage of the students from high poverty communities. Um, and we have worked throughout the pandemic to offer thousands of vaccine clinics uh, in our schools across our communities. In addition to that, we've also provided millions of meals uh, for our students and their families to address the food insecurities that occurred uh, throughout the pandemic. And we've worked to ensure that our students and their families have had their basic needs met uh, throughout the pandemic and understanding, and we've had the understanding that ensuring that those basic needs are met is paramount to making sure that our students arrive at our school doors ready to learn. Um, it, given that there are some adverse challenges that our communities affect, and we are joining those who have uh, called for uplifting the need to address the health inequities in our low income communities across the country. In particular, I'll, I'll note uh, Washington, D.C., and this was from a few weeks ago, but we looked at the vaccination rates for 12 to 17 year olds in our more affluent communities in Washington, D.C., as well as some of our low income communities. Two of the wards in D.C. with uh, who are, that are more affluent had 65 and 71 percent vaccination rates in their communities, respectively. And two of the low income uh, communities of color had 16 percent and 20 percent vaccination rates. And these are of children who are, excuse me, who are 12 to 17 years old. In addition to that, uh, those higher affluent wards had uh, 57, unfortunately, 57 and 63 uh, fatalities as a result of the pandemic, but those lower income wards had 240 and 261 fatalities as a result of the pandemic, four to five times that of those who are in the higher income communities. And so our students in communities with poor health have missed more in-person learning uh, as a result of just the lower vaccination rates and the other issues that have been challenging uh, to their communities, just the access to higher quality health has been a challenge for them. In addition to that, these students in those communities have faced greater loss of guardians and loved ones uh, during the pandemic. And as the country, and as a country, we must prioritize, prioritize addressing the health inequities across our communities uh, that ensure our students and families are safe and we can maximize every child's opportunities to learn. And throughout the pandemic, our superintendents, our teachers, our principals have not only served as educators for many of our students, but they've served as health advisors. They've served to help our communities provide health supports. And it's all been primarily to ensure that our students can continue to access learning and access learning opportunities in ways that are beneficial to them long term. So I look forward to addressing your questions. But again, we appreciate you having us on this program. Dr. Hart, we appreciate it in your work too. And I think your comments are so important because this pandemic has so glaringly revealed or revealed much more deeply the, the deep disparities uh, in, in this country and, and in the public health uh, realm. Uh, Corey Astill, uh, to you now and your perspective on this. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And uh, many thanks to APHA for the invitation. And I want to make a special thanks to John Bridgeland and the COVID Collaborative for their dedication and service. They've been uh, a tremendous partner for, for, for the Business Roundtable and really the business community at every stage. So just to give you a sense, Business Roundtable is a membership organization of CEOs of America's leading companies. We work to promote a, a thriving U.S. economy. Our CEO members collectively lead companies with more than 20 million employees and $9 trillion in annual revenue. So the link between physical and economic health of our country obviously became startlingly clear over the past two years. This experience showed that ensuring that federal, state, and local governments, including the critical public health functions, are prepared to respond to a novel uh, and changing circumstances. We believe public health played an important role to support businesses by keeping employees and customers safe and informed about how to handle the immediate impacts of the pandemic and then transition back to new, safer way of operating in light of the ongoing pandemic risks. That's where we are now. Business Roundtable companies recognized right at the start of COVID-19, uh, the outbreak, you know, they could also play a role, a key role in addressing the critical shortage of medical equipment and supplies. Business Roundtable companies increased production and expanded access to diagnostic testing capacity, kept critical and essential services operating, 
and supply day-to-day -day necessities such as food and medicine. Business Roundtable companies have worked to ensure safe and healthy work environments as more employees return to their jobs. At the same time, our companies invested heavily in research and development and helped bring three vaccines, seven therapeutics, and one antiviral drug against COVID-19 to the market in less than one year, when a typical vaccine development takes five to 10 years or more. And through our Move the Needle campaign, something we, we started last February, about a year from now, uh, before now, our CEO supported the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, increased vaccine uptake, and encouraged individuals to take precautions like wearing masks. BRT was very supportive of vaccines from the very beginning. Um, obviously, the pandemic has exacted a devastating toll. And despite the best efforts of so many in the federal, state, and local levels and in the private sector, um, it's clear that much more must be done to prevent the devastating loss of life and mitigate the significant economic impacts of another health emergency. Uh, whether that's uh, the next stage of COVID or something different. That includes strengthening the public health sector moving forward so that we can serve it, so that it can serve its critical functions well. Business Roundtable absolutely applauds efforts in Congress to thoroughly examine public health authorities and roles to improve our preparedness moving forward. Um, beyond the urgent public health preparedness response issues brought to light, our companies are also committed to doing their part to improve the health of communities and the underlying drivers of health, as, as our, the previous guests mentioned. In addition to the substantial investments businesses make in wellness programs and healthcare coverage for their employees, many businesses have pioneered practical ways to improve health and productivity in their communities by addressing social determinants of health. This includes actions like investing in affordable housing and developing career pathways and providing skills training uh, for people in low and moderate income neighborhoods. By partnering with key players like public health, businesses can help communities become and stay healthy, achieve overall health and well-being, and strive uh, in their communities, which their empl uh, employees, customers, and suppliers live. So in conclusion, I'd say the pandemic demonstrated that the connection and partnership between business and public health needs to be strong. We need to protect the health of our people and our economy. Thanks for, uh, for the invite and welcome any questions you might have. That's great. All right. Well, let's let I'm going to I hereby declare a lightning round here because uh, time is, is 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 moving on here. And I want to ask each of you a, a question or two. And um, let's see if we can tick through this uh, uh, quickly. But I think you've all raised very important points and you've all highlighted the vital importance of partnerships and communication and collaboration to do things. So, Cynthia, first to you, if I may, um, how about some examples where where you think public health has successfully partnered with other communities um, uh, to, to identify the champions and come away with, with positive outcomes? Sure, I mean, Atlantic City, New Jersey may be a good one because it is something that, a campaign that is happening right now in Atlantic City. I mean, New Jersey had a mask mandate so the casinos, which were the only workplace that were exempted from a statewide smoke-free law that was adopted several years ago, casino workers temporarily had a smoke-free environment. And on July 4th, 2021, when smoke was reestablished, they were very angry. And fortunately, we as an organization at the national level had been partnering with the local coalition, Smoke Free Atlantic City, who had a connection with one employee, which then blossomed into something else. And there's times where you have to build trust and credibility and provide trainings. And our philosophy has always been to, you know, really do that training and try to build capacity for those individuals because people know what we in public health are going to say and the opposition is going to say well you know but the people who work they, they they knew it and they liked it so the second example is just by happenstance in, in tennessee which by the way is a state with preemption so localities could not adopt a law tennessee state law exempts age restricted venues 21 and over so that means bars and music clubs and during the pandemic we took what was a campaign to work with musicians and do like smoke-free bar nights and have musicians perform and give testimonials. We had to transfer that to an online platform, which was then how we met a musician in Nashville. And again, kind of went through that same process. It's, uh, <laughs> it's almost like dating where you have to get to know one another, build trust, find out if you have similar interests. Turned out that the musician had asthma. We talked a little bit about how secondhand smoke, you know, impacts that and going from there. And, and we talked a little bit about how to navigate the political scene in a state that really wasn't very open to, again, local control. And that, and and that, any you felt was, and that was successful. You had a successful outcome from that? 
Right. And yeah. we what what started off as a voluntary campaign in Nashville has grown into a legislative campaign where we now have a bill pending to repeal preemption in Tennessee on right. that one narrow provision. Very interesting. Very interesting. Ray Hart, how about to you? Let me let me ask you this. How do you think the, and we've heard about this earlier in, in, in some of the conversations from Hemi and others, how do you think these legal challenges and policy challenges and changes with respect to public health um, can, can impact the ability of schools to protect the health of the students now and going forward? So I think we've seen it uh, throughout the country uh, where we've been able to enact mass mandates uh, in our schools or whether our districts have done that. Uh, you've seen that we've been able to mitigate the spread of the virus. We've been able to keep kids safe uh, in schools and we've been able to reopen schools successfully. And I think the partnerships that we've had both with public health to lift up uh, vaccination clinics, many of which were staffed by our public health departments uh, have benefited our communities. Clearly, we have more work to, to do uh, just in making sure that our communities are safe, uh, making sure that uh, again, our children are vaccinated as we move forward, uh, making sure that across our communities, we're able to keep kids in school um, and, and make sure that uh, the vi not only this virus, but then long term, looking at the health issues that impact our communities more broadly, that we're able to invest in those communities and invest mm -hmm. in uh, local health departments, making sure that just as we've had food deserts across our communities, we also have health deserts. So making sure that our children have access to high quality uh, pediatricians and high quality health care and our families do as well is important moving forward. Uh, Corey, over to you. Um, this legislation that I mentioned and we've heard about um, also affects the ability of businesses uh, that are interested in trying to keep their employees safe and what they can do and what they can say. How do you see this affecting the ability of, of, of businesses to sort of act uh, to promote and safeguard the health well-being of their of their employees or workforce? Yeah, I, I may not know exactly which legislation you're talking about, but we, we have been very vocal throughout, I mean, the last six months in particular, where states and localities have moved to prevent uh, businesses from, from protecting their employees in the ways that they think is, is most helpful and most effective. And, and we, we, I mean, we have, uh, we pushed back on that and we, we don't believe that that uh, is the, is the best path forward. I mean, companies, businesses, small, large, whatever size, should have the ability to take steps to protect their employees. So that's very that's that's where we stand on that. Okay. Well, I, we could go on for some great length. Unfortunately, uh, as I say, time is time is against us here. But thank you all for your comments, Cynthia Hallett and Dr. Ray Hart, Corey Astill. Appreciate it very, very much, and, and good luck to all of you in in the work that you're pursuing. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, now we're going to hear from someone who combines a lot of knowledge, a lot of science, a lot of work in public health and advocacy uh, and on the ground, real world, real people experience about our healthcare system and, and, and public health. Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, he's chief medical officer for prevention from the American uh, at the American Heart Association and prior to joining AHA, served as vice president CMO for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas. Uh, whereas I understand it, Dr. Sanchez, you focused on such things as critical prevention and chronic disease management, health disparities, a lot of the things we've been hearing about and talking about here today. So I invite you to provide some overview comments, and then I look forward to uh, some uh, conversation with you. So uh, please, and welcome, and thanks for your time, too. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm so humbled by um, all who have preceded me. I do wanna thank APHA for putting this on. I think this is such an important conversation to be had. I mean, I wanna thank each and every one of the panelists for what they do every day to make a difference in people's lives. Um, I think one other thing I'll add, Frank, is that I served as a state health officer for the state of Texas and I was a local health officer in Austin, Travis County. So I've got governmental public health background as well. Um, I, I, I think one thing to say is, I'm feeling pretty heartened by the conversation today. It's not to say that things are easy, but it is to say that what I heard was a solutions focused set of comments made by folks. Um, um, I think the future can be uh, bright if we can um, articulate some shared goals. I think equity and um, good health for everybody is a thing that we can probably find some common ground. I certainly heard that from um, folks like Senator Kenley um, and others. There, there is a shared desire to uh, have, a, have us all be healthy. Um, I, I heard about convening 
the players, um, diverse, multi-sectoral. Uh, my experience in uh, governmental public health was to bring those who might be opposed to what it is that you have in mind. Um, it's always better to have a, a multi-stakeholder group that covers the uh, entire um, continuum. Uh, I do think that that can lead to a, a, a plan for action. And I heard examples of plans for action. Uh, they may not be all comprehensive, but I heard about um, bringing people together, listening. Um, I, I heard Governor um, uh, Levitt talk about how important it is to listen. Um, borrowing from another person, I'm a possibilist. Uh, we should all be possibilists and realists at the same time. Um, this can be done because it is getting done in, in places. How do we borrow and make it work where we are? Um, I'm reminded that what we're talking about, assuring the public's health is a team sport. I'm reminded that in a team sport, you're playing generally the long game. And we need to collectively be able to look at short term, intermediate term and long term horizons, um, because there's some things we got to take care of today. There's some things we got to take, take care of this year. And there's things we need to have the conversations to be able to affect for the future. Um, I do think we need to have that conversation about what is public health, and we need to figure out how to better describe what it is that public health is. Do we separate public health, the goal, um, the, the optimized health of the public from the role and the function of organized public health? Do we launch a refreshed marketing and awareness raising campaign with market research, rebranding, focus groups. And, and quite frankly, I think that the work that I heard described by Senator Kenley is a little bit of that. It's not, um, it, it was focus groups. Um, I tried to ploy when I was uh, in local government, public health is public safety. And for a little while, I did present with the, um, my, my uh, firefighter friends and my uh, other public safety friends. I do think that there's an opportunity for us to talk about what public health is. I think about um, the uh, MMWR publication um, that described the public health achievements of the 20th century. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there's a few things that happened. Public health, at least according to that article, um, increased life expectancy by 30 years. Um, inequitably, I will argue, but by 30 years. And what's on that list? Well, vaccinations on the top of that list, and I'm not going to go through all of them. You can search this and you should read this because what it tells us that motor vehicle safety is a part of it. Safer workplaces is a part of it. Um, safer, healthier foods. I work for the Heart Association, so I got to mention reduced cardiovascular disease and stroke deaths, fluoridation of, of drinking water, and um, um, reduced tobacco use. Um, that is not a list that is just about infectious disease. There's a couple of things that come out of that as well. Um, in Sites. That work um, in any one of those areas was really, really hard work. Um, and we who are interested in um, the public's health um, have learned to know how to swim upstream against strong currents. Every now and then we get a little bit of a break, but then that strong current can start all over again. We stay determined, focused, and undeterred. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves the question and put to the public, what will it take to increase life expectancy by another 10, 20, or 30 years? Um, equitably, I might add. How do we build on that discussion to further improve the public's health and further improve our capacity to do so? I do want to spend one second saying there are some things that we learned and can put to use right away around COVID. Um, some of those are some I think false dualities, um, the duality of equality or equity, the duality of public health or clinical care, the duality of communicable disease um, or non-communicable disease, the, the duality of high tech or high touch, um, the duality of mental health or physical health. And I think that we need to shift our conversation from this or that constructs to this and that systems. Um, so in closing, the end game, I believe, is a high performing system, health and non-health, I heard that from many, that effectively and equitably protects, preserves, and promotes health for all. It needs to be multi-pronged, multi-sectoral, 
diverse, multi-focused, data informed. Let me add, it needs to bring all stakeholders and find the common ground. It needs to be evidence-based and evidence generating. It needs to be non-governmental and governmental. And I'm gonna close with two quotes. One is a nod to our colleague, Paul Farmer, um, who said, I'm not a cynic, I'm not cynical at all. Cynicism is a dead end. And the other quote I sort of alluded to, Hans Rosling, I'm not an optimist, I'm a very serious possibilist. And I wanna close by saying, let's roll up our sleeves and turn possibility into reality. I think we can do that. I appreciate the opportunity. Wow, what great comments. I, 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 you, you summarized this and you inspired us. I love the, the possible stuff. Sometimes I refer to myself as a glass half empty optimist. So I don't know if those are the same sorts of things. I mean, we're realistic, but we can, we can hope. I really want to pick, you up on, pick up on that, though, with you and have you take a few minutes again, because I'm thinking of our audience, people from across the country, many of whom work in public health or they're proximate to public health, or certainly they care about it or they wouldn't be here with us right now. When you think about what it takes to be a possibilist in a time of such polarization, and you know Texas, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just making an observation. Texas is a very um, polarized place, as many are in the country right now. How do possibilists succeed? How do you do these things and move this forward at a time when the country is so divided over things that are so personal, like our health and our mask and our vaccines? I think you find the way to have the conversations that need to be had, and uh, that sounds uh, trite. But uh, one of the things that um, I learned from colleagues, um, I, I will just say right here, just to embarrass him, one of my mentors, uh, public health mentors is Dr. Georges Benjamin. Um, but I learned from my mentors that um, it's really important to reach out to the senators that you know are gonna support you um, and the senators that maybe are not gonna support you um, or the issues that you are um, engaging in um, and, and the other elected officials and have the conversations that try to find common ground on the one hand that um, 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 make you and those who work with you um, be at least a source for credible information. I did find that um, I, um, I was pleased when folks who, even when they voted against what I had brought forward, um, engaged in the dialogue to make an informed decision. But informed decisions are dependent on good information, but that is um, predicated on trust and relationships. And rather than um, anticipate a pandemic in the future and wait till it happens, it is time right now to have those kind of conversations to create the kinds of forums that, again, I heard um, uh, um, Senator Kenley, Kenley talk about, that I heard described as the way the business roundtable is doing its work, where you can have the kinds of conversations where differing viewpoints can result in the thing that can happen, the possible. So how do you recommend that people who are listening, watching this conversation, listening to it, watching this conversation now and, and care about this, take action. What specific things within their communities, their states, their, their governments, their whatever level, what specific things do you recommend and what, what works? Well, what works is different in different places. And so I do think that one needs to be mindful of where they are. Um, I do think that we, 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 so again, I would say, take the first step to uh, knock on the door of somebody who you might perceive as having been your foe around a public health issue during this pandemic and say, let's have a conversation. Um, uh, I heard the, the, uh, um, the discussions being had about the number of different um, initiatives, advisory boards, laws that are being contemplated, um, none of that happens without knocking on the door and having that conversation. Be, be bold, um, uh, be, be confident, um, but also um, uh, be ready to listen. So I, 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 I want to go all the way to the beginning. And Mike Levitt had it right. Um, sometimes you just got to stop and listen and understand where people are um, validate that where they are, um, you can understand where they are and use that as the point to begin that 
that discussion, that journey. And I think that applies to elected officials, that applies to stakeholder groups that um, one works with, that applies to um, sister agencies, that applies to partnering with business. Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, I thank you so, so much for your uh, time here, for your insights, for your advice, and for your work at the American Heart Association. I mean, if there's anybody we wish success to, it, it is you. So thank you again for all of this. It's been very valuable, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Well, this has been a, a remarkable uh, hour and a half or so of comments and conversations, insight and suggestions. And as you just heard uh, Dr. Sanchez say, there's a lot on the table here for us to absorb how we describe and engage what public health is, the value that it has to our communities, the life that it conveys, the improvements in our quality of life along the way, the need to convene and to listen, 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 even when that's difficult, and to seek solutions, bracketing it around it, framing it around the health and the quality of life we all want. This is very difficult stuff because we're at a very difficult time, uh, polarized anyway, but exacerbated by this terrible pandemic that has driven so many people into so many places and, 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 and delivered so much pain. But we can do it, and people do want hope. And I think there's some of that here too. So I hope this has been a helpful conversation. A couple of final items for you, resources around these challenges to public health authority in the new public health and equity resource navigator um, is available to you. The Alliance is developing that. That's gonna be available for your viewing. Technical assistance and resources from the partners working in this space with us. Um, that's support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the local support uh, uh, center that uh, is a consortium of public health law partners. The American Public Health, health Association will be bringing that, our state and public health together, uh, health partners together around that, along with the American Heart Association. So there'll be resources there as well. Uh, also be providing some training uh, for those interested in learning more and getting engaged in these issues. That's very important. We have a first training around advoca advocacy with the Change Lab Solutions. That's scheduled for March 22nd from 3 to 4 p.m., so you'll be able to see some more and get some more information on that. But for any questions or more information, uh, questions you may have or more information you may want, please contact us at alliance at APAHA.org. That again is alliance at APAHA.org. We're hoping that this conversation today is a conversation starter that can help people understand where and how they can proceed uh, to advance this and advocate for public health at all levels uh, of life and, and government. So I want to thank everybody on behalf of the American Public Health Association, the Alliance for Disease Prevention and Response and the COVID Collaborative. Thanks too to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their amazing support uh, throughout a vital conversation at a vital time. I'm Frank Sesno. Thank you so much. Good luck, good health, stay healthy. And uh, we hope very much that this conversation has been beneficial. Have a great day and a great evening.